Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. I like a church that can laugh and enjoy itself. I don't even know what they're laughing about back there, but I dig it. <laughs> I've been in churches where if you were laughing, somebody would be giving you the evil eye one. Because, you know, fun, first three letters in funeral. <laughs> right? Sheesh. You know, sometimes you just want to pray, God, save us from ourselves. I mean, we are our own worst enemy. Unbelievable. Well, uh, yesterday was a phenomenal day. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody or, you know, anything like that. But here's what I want to do. If, if you were out there yesterday in any capacity whatsoever, you know what I'm talking about. We're out on the corner of Canis and Ferndale. Uh, did you say we served a 1,000 sandwiches? I mean, unbelievable. If you were there in any capacity yesterday, just stand up. Please, for me, for me. I want, yeah, absolutely. I wanted them to give yourselves a hand. <laughs> I mean, I want to thank you guys. It was, a, it was a great turnout. I mean, you know, we're not a large body, but, man, we had a huge presence on that corner yesterday, and it was really phenomenal. The people that came through, um, uh, one of the guys that headed up the volunteer fire department came in at about 11, and we, we thought we were going to be taking the food out, and he came in, and we put, we gave him 100 sandwiches, uh, beans, chips, cookies, the whole, you know, the whole works, and uh, he went out, and then other people were coming in that were taking the food, actually, too, people working in the, what we're talking about is an area that's, that was hit out in uh, Ferndale and Perrin that really hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention, you know, from the media, because it, wa it wasn't hit quite um, as devastatingly as Mayflower and Valonia, but it was, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's still hit. A uh, tornado's a tornado, and um, there was a loss of life out there and uh, all the rest of it. So, tremendous opportunity, and um, this is something I talked about with a couple of people yesterday. Uh, Darren and Rebecca have this massive smoker that it's a tr on a big trailer, you know, you have to, you have to pull it behind, uh, you'd have to have a, yeah, a bus, basically, to, to get it. But this was something that God gave the people who had the tools to accomplish the mission, the vision for it. And uh, someone who, who doesn't mind uh, being, a, being a connector, being a um, networker is the, is the term, the, you know, the, the hip term you would use today in business and ministry, a networker. And so Rebecca is calling all these different places and, and gathering, making connections with people that they do business with that could donate meat or money or, you know, buns or oil for chainsaws or just whatever else was necessary and making all these connections and then they had the tools to accomplish this God gave them that vision it would have been ridiculous for them to go hey you know we got this smoker why don't somebody why don't somebody come and drag this up there and you know put these pounds of meat on there and all the rest of this stuff I mean they had the the vision for it and um, that's the listen it's it's not the only time it's happened in the past nine and a half years, but we've been moving away from a top-down authoritarian system for a long time. And we have even a lot of people that have come along since we broke away from that that shouldn't be influenced by it, but apparently most ministries function that way just about, period. And that is, that is not the way I have ever, ever functioned. I know who I am. I'm not, I'm not scared or intimidated by, you know, somebody taking something away from me. My gift is pastor-teacher. I herd cats. That's what I do. That's my job. <laughs> It's really, if you've ever pastored, then you know it's much like herding cats. So, <laughs> towards, a, towards a pond. Yeah, how about that? I'll throw that in at the end. Or towards a bathtub, baptizing cats. <laughs> you know? So, I, you know, I don't have that, whatever that thing is that has to control and dominate and tyrannize and micromanage, I don't have it. And I'm glad because I hate that. I hated it being under it and various bosses that I've worked for. I don't operate that way. I love freedom, spontaneity, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so to see someone just embrace the idea that God gave them for service to what turned out to be at least a thousand meals, not necessarily a thousand people, but at least a thousand meals for people who are in need, and to watch other people administrate and the rest of us just come together and do some grunt work, right? I was glad to show up somewhere yesterday, and uh, there's Madison beside me, and there's other people over there, and we're making sandwiches. Boom. 
boom, slapping meat on, put the bun on, let her wrap. I mean, just get in the assembly line. This is what I love. This is what I do. This is the exercise of my gift. But in that kind of situation, I am glad to just come in and do some grunt work. And I, I love that. I enjoyed that. So on a spiritual note, that's exactly how ministry is supposed to function in the body of Christ. God plants something within your heart. And you may think, well, this is nuts. This sounds crazy. Listen, just come and share it with us. Give us the opportunity, the rest of the body, Larry, the opportunity to say, what do you need and how can we help? Just give us the opportunity. Twirling around in your mind about how nuts it sounds for years on end gets nobody nowhere, right? Double negative for emphasis only. That's not, that's not accomplishing anything. But if he gives it to you until someone else arises to lead in this ministry or uh, there is someone to take it over, you're probably the point man or woman. You're probably the person that, that needs to head it up if you have the vision for it. Uh, that's just, uh, it's just a, it's, a, it's a busy, busy time in our society, unfortunately, and it's across the board. It's too busy, but uh, I, think that's the way it should, I think that's the way it should work. We should step up and be, that, uh, be this, the, the person that uh, heads it up until someone else arises maybe to take the, to take the reins. But it was a good day and uh, a, lot of, a lot of wonderful ministry and a good time for the people that were there. And a lot of opportunities to speak into people's lives as they came along and to pray with people. And um, it was good. I'm, I just want you to know how proud I am of you guys. And, and last week, what was given for that family, for the Smith family in Valonia that lost their two boys, I read that email uh, with what we had decided to do with our own checking account and the money that came in last week. Listen, it came out to $1,345. Um. I, I'm just, I'm very, I'm very proud of you guys. It never ceases to amaze me the grace that, that God can pour through open and willing channels. So, ladies, happy Mother's Day to you. I don't have a Mother's Day message, but I just want to say happy Mother's Day <laughs> to all of you moms. There is a, there's uh, one of my f- favorite artists I just discovered here in the past, I don't know, six months or so is a, uh, a jazz artist by the name of uh, Gregory Porter. And uh, just amazing baritone and, and writes most of his own music. And in the lyric of one of his songs, it's actually not a song about mothers. It's a song about a break in a relationship. He's got this lyric, and it, it never fails to hit home. My mother is still alive, and she's right here with us right now. She is a true lady of grace, generous beyond anything you can imagine. That's her gifting. I've watched her bless Life after life after life after life, family after family through the years, friend after friend. And the lyric in the song says, he sings, I wish my mama was here. A strong, strong, steady rose is the lyric. She would know what to do, what to say, how to pray to make things better. And every time I hear that, I think, well, that's the power of a mama. Ladies, you have undeniable power in your families. The father represents really God in a sense. It's a scary, scary thought. <laughs> no, I mean, it really is. The weight of that is, 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 is scary. But mothers, wives, you have undeniable power in your families. And you, can, you have the ability to, to help strengthen your husband or emasculate him, really. And you, you want, whether you, whether you think you do or not, you want you want a strong man who walks with God and who is, uh, embraces his power, will do the hard thing, will stay to the end, fight to the finish, all the rest of those things that may look aggressive at times from the outside. You need that. You need that. And families need that. And you have this power in your children's lives as well because nobody's ever going to replace you, father or mother, but mothers. I mean, you are that formative. You're the nurturer. You're the Holy Spirit to the child for the first six, seven, eight, nine years. And you have the more impact than, than anybody. Use that time wisely. In the name of all that's holy, please, use that time wisely. And if you're struggling in your marriage because you can't seem to find the right balance between uh, being an encouragement to your husband and getting your way, you know, can't seem to find that middle ground, get some help, please, get some help. Because you do, you, you have the, in the old saying, uh, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. 
There is truth to that in a family. I mean, you literally can, you can spread misery like fertilizer. I mean, it, 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 really, if it's, that's just true. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, on that beautiful note, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> All right. Teams are already in the second round of the NBA playoffs. Every time that they take the court, those teams will be involved. Three teams will be involved in the action. The home team, the opposing team, and the officiating team. The third team's job, the referees, is to exercise the authority given them by the commissioner. And this used to be David Stern. Now it's a man named Adam Silver. When play goes awry and things go squirrely on the court and the whistles come out, they may decide in favor of the opposing team or they may decide in favor of the home team, but regardless, they're not on the court to curry favor and please the crowd. They don't belong to either team. Are you with me? We're talking about referees. We're talking about the people who are officiating. They don't belong to either team, not the Spurs or the Thunder, not the Heat or the Nets. They don't care whether a player is black, white, red, yellow, or brown. They don't care. Their job Cheryl is to carry out the commands of the commissioner who represents the kingdom with which they are aligned. Now, their kingdom is the NBA. That's the kingdom with which they are aligned. They bring the authority of the kingdom up there, in this case, 645 Fifth Avenue, New York City, to bear on the chaos of the conflict down here. They're not taking sides with either team in front of them. Now, one last swipe at this passage, and we're going to finish it up. Take a look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 16. I'm going to read this to you rather briefly. And uh, that subtitle should actually be eternally identified. Eternally identified. I had that. I changed it, and then I never changed it back. <laughs> I did. So didn't, that's the only missing link in my presentation right there. Here's what it says. Matthew closes out his gospel. Then the 11 disciples, this is the 12 minus Judas Iscariot, went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. He had instructed them to go to this place. This is the only place that we have recorded for us in Scripture. You can see it up there as he speaks to uh, the two Marys. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. We know this is a, uh, a post-resurrection meeting. The only one we know of where he says, listen, be here at this time. Boom. And they were there. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and we remember the story of Thomas. We know until he said, I can put my hands in the wounds, uh, he wasn't quite sure. Every time people come together to worship, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter when or how many, somebody's going to have a head full of doubt. It's just, it, it exists. You have to know it. Not everybody is going to get it. And nobody in this room is going to get everything that I say today. Nobody. We don't work that way. But one way you can help increase the ability to retain is to jot some things down. That uh, boosted by about 60%, if you're interested at all in that. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. One command in this passage, make disciples. Go is, a, is simply a participle that explains wh wherever you're going, whenever you're going, do this. This is the command. The command is to make disciples. And we do that by the other participles that surround it, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That, by the way, is a concrete claim to deity where Jesus equates himself with both the Father and the Spirit. And teaching them, that's the other thing. These are participles. The main command is uh, make disciples. And anytime you have that, you have an imperative surrounded by participles in the Greek. The participles give you the how-to, the means to execute the command. Are you tracking with that? This is how to make disciples. We baptize them and we teach them to do everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I thought it was just a neat little note here that uh, that phrase, with you always, Matthew ends his gospel the way he begins. Remember what he says? The angel tells him you shall have a, a son and will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That will be with you always to the very end of the age. The apostles hears or be evangelized and enlisted as followers of the king. Those who believe that we encounter are to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This public declaration of allegiance. We had a baptism, a pretty good size one. I think we had probably seven or eight people about a year ago or last summer sometime. And uh, 
It's a public declaration of allegiance. It would associate them with Jesus in the eyes of the world. It would as baptizo, which is the verb behind which we get, from which we get baptism, it would, as this word always did in the ancient world, identify them with the person of Jesus Christ and the triune God. Because the God they now serve is one God in three persons. Abba, which is the Aramaic word for father, papa, daddy, an intimate term, son, and Holy Spirit. Notice that he didn't say baptize them into the names, in plural, but into the name, singular, of the one true God. What Jesus is doing is affirming yet again the reality of the Trinity. The concept being grounded in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, but coming in this instance directly from him. Now, look at the word baptizing. Baptizing, and let's just, let's branch out from this for just a moment. Baptizing is a transliteration, okay? Not a translation, a transliteration where we bring letter for letter from one language over into another. So what we, with this particular word, rather than giving it a meaning, rather than uh, them translating it, and they, uh, they dip to this person, immerse this person, they, you know, rather than trying to get the meaning behind it, identification, that kind of idea, they just brought it letter for letter over, and we have an English understanding of baptism. It's a transliteration of the Greek verb baptizo, B-A-P-T-I-Z-O, which when you add up all the aggregate ideas underlying it, means at its base. And this is what I've distilled down through the years. At its base, it means to identify, to identify with a purpose. That is the idea behind baptizo, to identify with a purpose. It was used by poets and dramatists and historians in ancient Greece to connote the identification of one object with another to such an extent that the very nature of the first object is altered dramatically. So we identify one thing with a second thing, and as we do that, this thing, this first thing, whatever it is, or whoever it is, the nature of it is altered dramatically. The very essence of it changed from that point forward. That's the idea. Baptizo was used in classical Greek of blacksmiths, immersing Bruce a piece of hot iron in water to temper it to harden it. It was used of Greek soldiers, Joe, placing the points of their swords and barbarians the points of their spears uh, in a vat of blood. So we identify this now with bloodshed, with warfare. In fact, Xenophon, who was a Greek historian in the 4th century BC, tells of Spartan soldiers dipping their spears into pig's blood before going into battle. By identifying the spears with blood, they transform the nature of the spear. Is it still a spear? Yes. The nature of it has been transformed from a tool for hunting to a weapon of war. There's a difference. And they understood that difference. And it was symbolic in a lot of ways, but they would march by and whoo, and they would shove this thing down in the blood and bring it back up and say, now we're ready. Now we're ready. It was just, that, that's, that's how they made the switch. Now we're going to, uh, to defend, we're going to conquer, we're going to do what we need to do, and this is how we get ready to do it. Baptizo was also used of a dye maker, someone who dyed wool or cloth for another. They would take the garment, it's, let's say it's, uh, you wanted to dye a piece of fabric for your mother. It was the Greek version of Mother Day. Mother's Day was coming up, right? Sent this Mother's Day, we'll use that. And you wanted to take this, uh, this beautiful piece of uh, wool or cloth or whatever it was, and you were going to dye it for your mother so that, uh, you know, she could have this lovely toga out of it, right? So you would take that to the dye maker, and he would take it, and he would dip the garment into a vat of colored liquid. He would bring it back up. He would hang it on a rack and allow it to dry, and then he would return it to its owner. Whereas before now, it may have been, uh, you know, white as cotton, right, or white as wool. Now it's navy blue. Now it's purple. Now it's crimson. Now it's whatever it is. Would you say that the nature of this, not the fabric itself, but the nature of the garment has been changed dramatically? If you bring it back up and it's crimson now, whereas before it was white, absolutely, absolutely. It's been vastly changed from its former condition. The kingdom of our culture here in the United States seems to be preoccupied with the issue of color, color. The mingling of the races in America and how to accomplish its vision of equality. The kingdom of our culture is ever vying for our attention and affection with the kingdom of God. And it seems to be preoccupied a lot with, with various issues that don't seem to be an issue to God. Don't seem to, be, seem to be an issue in the body of Christ. And while I'm neither a political scientist nor a sociologist, from the vantage point of liberty and common sense, I can give you a couple of hints on how to accomplish the mingling of any race, of all races in any country, and a vision of uh, equality in the sense of being treated equal. P. 
people are not equal. People have varying levels of, of gifting, talents, natural abilities, athletic ability. Uh, there's a reason why there are professional football players, professional basketball players, professional soccer players, etc. There's a reason why there are professional musicians and the rest of us. The reason why there are, there are great writers and, uh, and then mediocre writers and then writers where you go, did this guy, can he speak English? You know, I mean, there, it's, there's, there's not equality in that sense, but there should be equality before the law. And there, there is definitely equality at the foot of the cross, because when you come to the cross, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And grace levels the ground. And when we come into a relationship with God and we step into it by faith, we have an opportunity now where there is the only, the only real place where there is any sense of equality. We have the same Holy Spirit who indwells us, Chris. We have the same Word of God to guide us. What we do with it now depends on our decisions. Depends on our faith, and are we willing to trust the Father's heart toward us? Are we just going to keep keep bouncing around between trust a little bit and then mistrust the next day, and then trust a little bit and then mistrust the next day, and then trust a little bit, and we just do this thing where we hop back and forth, and we never actually make any progress toward the goal of becoming an apprentice of Jesus, living in and from the resources of His kingdom. We never actually move forward or get to any stated place, but the opportunity is there. That's what. That's what. Liberty does. It gives us the opportunity. So just a couple of quick things here. And this, is, this is more for, this would be for the government or for society at large or for anybody that needs it. Treat everyone equally to begin with as citizens under the same constitution. How about an amen on that? Not one set of rules and laws for the rich and another for the poor. Or one for those who can afford quality legal counsel. In this country, if you can afford it, you can probably get off from just about anything. If you can't, you're going to jail. Period over and out. Whatever color you are. If you can't afford a good lawyer, you're going to jail, Jack. I mean, just, that's the way it is. So there's one set of rules and laws for those who can afford quality legal counsel and one for those who can't. One for certain races or classes and one for the rest. America has what, right now, has what can only be classified as a prison industrial complex. Where it's a for-profit penal system. States have been, since the mid-1980s, have been privatizing prisons at the state level and also at the federal level at a pretty rapid rate. We have a for-profit penal system where states, now listen to me, I am for the most part for uh, free and fair markets, both. They can coexist, by the way. But states which have embraced this form of privatization are required to keep occupancy at or above 90%. But what, I mean, guess what's going to happen? If you're required and uh, you have privatized your prisons within a state to a, to a private company, a for-profit company, and you're required to keep occupancy at or above 90%, no surprise here, we have more criminals, Josh, more convictions and longer sentences than ever before because we've got to keep them full. In fact, here in, in Arkansas, most of the jails and the prisons are overcrowded. They can't even, they can't even now they can't find enough room. The U.S., has 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. Just think about that for a moment. We have 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of all of the prisoners in the world. From 1980 to 2008, our prison population quadrupled in this country. Quadrupled. From 500,000 to 2.3 million, where we stand now. The vast majority of this incarceration increase is due to two things. And this is my sociological point of view, but it's not absent of fact. Two things. And horrific failure popularly known as the war on drugs, which we have clearly lost in this country and, and are going to lose from here on out. You, you, you're, not gonna, you're not going to win that. Prohibition has never worked in any society. It simply doesn't work. And federally mandated minimum sentencing guidelines. What that means is for many nonviolent, listen to me, nonviolent drug-related offenses, a judge cannot hand down, because it's a federally mandated sentencing guideline, he cannot hand down a sentence less than this, whatever this is mandated to be. Some facts about equality before the law. Five times as many Caucasians use illicit drugs as African Americans, yet African Americans are sent to prison for drug-related offenses at ten times the rate of whites. So let's sink in for a moment. I'm using the term African American because these, this sort of the politically correct term I got from a government website, by the way. Uh, I don't mind being called white, but not all Caucasians are white. After being yesterday, most of us are red after being out there yesterday, <laughs> or brownish, you know, somewhere around, somewhere leaning towards that. And I, and I don't, you know, but that, does, that doesn't bother me. White, okay, well, it just, it's just a categorization. It doesn't define me. It doesn't make me feel less than or anything else. 
Some will be using the term that's here. African Americans represent 12% of the population of drug users. 12% of the population of drug users, but 38% of those arrested for drug offenses. And listen, listen, 59% of those in state prison for drug-related offenses. 12% of use, 38% of total arrest, 59% of those in state prison for drug-related offenses. Are, are, are those numbers making any sense? Do they, are they communicating to you? Because there's a vast disparity between those numbers. African, African Americans serve almost as much time in prison for drug offenses, 59 months, as whites do for violent offenses, 62 months. So I could get arrested potentially, let's pray it doesn't happen, for beating the tar out of somebody, assault and battery, go to jail and serve around as much time or less than someone else got for simply possessing a particular substance. Yesterday when um, David was, was, was serving a man who came by and he just wanted a couple of sandwiches and so he was getting him sandwiches and, and the guy said, he drove up and he said, I don't have any money. <laughs> he was like, man, we're not charging for this. There's no, there's no change of money here. And I just thought to myself, what kind of low life scumbag sets up a food, you know, sets up to serve food in a disaster area and charges people for it? I will literally beat a man with a stick <laughs> for doing something like that. I mean, you talk about assault and batter, that is, that's unbelievable. What kind of scumbag would do that? Set up somewhere in a, a crisis area and start charging people for food. Sheesh. There's something, listen, that's, that's all of those, the prison facts, but there's something wrong with this picture. This mass prison industrial complex, whatever your race, white, black, Asian, Pacific Islander, right, all those different categories you check on the census, whatever your race, there's something wrong with that. Well, I can give you the name for it. I shared it with you last week. It's called fascism. Give us a tax code which is fair and flat. How about that for treating people, people equally before the law? Where people making 30000 a year are not paying more in taxes than ExxonMobil does while raking in record profits. I have a problem with that. You may be a corporation lover. I am not. I have no problem with people making money, but that's ridiculous. An army of lawyers and accountants that keep you from paying any tax. They paid zero tax in fiscal year 2010 while raking in record profits. And their record profits began when the rest of us were going down the drain the first quarter of 2009. And we all know. I mean, look at the, go to the, go, if you filled up lately, go, get, go to the gas pump. There's no shortage of oil on the market. And there's no, uh, and there's no uh, shortage of high prices at the pump. Should be a supply and demand thing, but apparently oil doesn't work like that. Make the only qualifications for employment, public or private, public or private employment. Make the only qualifications one's personal qualifications for employment. Does that, do I need to even say anything more? That that's, that's what you get hired on. Can you do this job? Or D, can you learn to do this job? And that's it. Not what you look like or where you come from. In other words, race, color, class, etc. And we all know that, I mean, there was a, that time may still exist, I don't know, but in the Mad Men era of the United States, women got hired for secretarial jobs for, a lot of times for the way they looked, period. I, mean, I don't know if she can type, I don't know if she can read, but, you know, she can look good sitting out front. You know, and I need something in the morning when I come in, you know, something good to look at, so. Let the government at every level stop playing class warfare, race warfare, party warfare, and watch how people band together and rise up regardless of color. It is the way it is because that's the way that the people in power want it. The way things are in this, when you, when you see the, the, the fraction and the splits and the, all of the Fox News versus MSNBC and conservative versus liberal and black versus white and all this stuff, 1% versus 99, all this class warfare, race warfare, party warfare, it is that way because that's the way that the people in power want it because the more that they pit you and I against each other, the less we do together. Yesterday was a perfect example of how the body of Christ can come together and, and meet a phenomenal need. And just, I mean, the heavy work was done by getting there the night before and setting up and putting that wood on it too in the morning and all the rest of that stuff. We come in and start putting the pieces together and, it, and it, this food is going out to, I mean, literally a thousand meals went out from there, from this little station out there. Um, this little spiritual uh, haven that was set up on the corner of this property. That's, a, that, that's how it happens. And there was, I mean, old and young and, and uh, black and white and whatever, all of us working together. And that's how it's supposed to be. But the Wall Street and the Wall Street Washington Nexus has no interest in you working together. 
with your fellow man, whether it be other believers or the people on your street or anything else. Because the more fractured that we are, the more power that they have to determine. Yeah. On a personal level, a relational level, it's as simple as this. You want to talk about, you want to talk about a, a mingling of the races and a, an accomplishment of uh, the opportunity for equality. The opportunity. It's as simple as this. Someone brilliant once said it. Treat others the same way you want to be treated. You want to be loved? Love people. You want mercy? Be merciful. You want grace? Be gracious. You want kindness? Be kind. You may not necessarily receive it from that person, but that's, you want to, you want to know what Jesus would do? What would Jesus do? We don't ask that. What did Jesus do? He did that. We don't have to wonder about this. <laughs> we go, oh, well, gosh, uh, look at my band. What would Jesus do? Let me think about that for the next hour. What did he do? Let's look at the scriptures. It's right there. And he taught us, treat others the same way you want to be treated. Do to everyone what you would want done for you. This is respect between human beings. Treat everyone the way that you want to be treated and do for them what you would want done for you. It's also, by the way, a proactive holiness in action. You're doing for others before they ask, before they even know they have a need necessarily. Proactive holiness in action. Do for others what you would want done for you one day. They may never return it. And guess what? That's okay. That's fine. They may never return the favor, so to speak. But God knows. And when you're in need one day, and you may not even know how in need you are, Joe, uh, all of a sudden he reaches down in grace and moves another one of his children in another place to come along and meet your need. You say, oh, that's what that was about. There it is. Now, we can look at these issues from a political perspective and laugh or cry, as the case may be. But what happens in the church of the living God? What happens in the realm of the Spirit? Is it any, is it any different? I mean, do we operate from a different paradigm, or we, do we just catch our arrogant attitudes toward one another, our racist reactions with each other in spiritual terms? And if you think, listen closely, if you think by racist, I'm referring only or exclusively to white versus black mentality, then one, you don't understand how my mind works at all. And two, you have no idea what the word racist means, if you think that's what I'm referring to. Racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism against someone of a different race, any race, based on the belief that said race is inferior or superior, in other words, jealousy and envy, to your race or other races. That's racism. Are you following with that? Discrimination, antagonism, prejudice against any other race based on the belief that this particular race, whatever it is, uh, black versus white, Mexican versus Asian, Asian versus Pacific Islander, whatever. Whatever. German versus Czechoslovakian. Hutu, Tutsis, genocide. You following? There is not a, there's not a person in this room. There's probably, not a, there's probably not anybody in the United States born in the United States. Maybe some people who have, who have migrated from Africa, immigrated from Africa. There's, there's probably not a person in the United States who could tell the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi by looking at them. But somehow, the hatred between them is so deep that they felt necessary to try to kill each other off. Genocide in Rwanda, that's what we're talking about. Those are the two tribes. They live side by side for dozens of years, and at some point in time, this thing erupts into a massive conflict. Apparently to them, the divide is so deep that we need to massacre everybody we can find. Exterminate them. It's discrimination, prejudice, antagonism against a different race because you think it's inferior or superior to your race. Any race. In certain circles of the church today, you have to be white to be right or black enough to fit in. You have to say things a certain way. You have to worship a certain way. You guys are too white for us. Well, you guys are too charismatic for us. You guys are too whatever it is. You might have to speak Spanish or have an interpreter to accommodate Hispanics. I'm not even saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying in some circles you have to have these things. Among the Asians, you have to be Korean or Chinese or Filipino to attend here. The culture of race, the culture of class, the culture of denominationalism and internecine warfare. What do I mean by that? I mean charismatic versus non-charismatic. Denominationalism. Uh, ev like evangelical versus independent, Protestant versus Catholic, traditional versus cutting edge. That culture demands conformity or else. It demands conformity. And the things, Dwayne, that we get so consumed with in Christianity today are, are not usually even, it's not even a matter of reality. It's usually just a matter of vocabulary, the way that you say things. Well, do you believe this? Sure. It's a major tenet of Scripture. That's one of the foundational Parts of our faith here at this church or that church or this body or that body. Well, do you believe it this way? Well, yeah, I think that's the way the scripture teaches it. Well, no, no, do you believe it this way? I, I need you to say it in the language that I want to hear or I'm not going to believe that you actually believe it. See, it's not a matter of reality or genuine faith. It's a matter of vocabulary. 
You don't use the same vocabulary I use, therefore you are wrong. You don't understand the word. You're not faithful to scripture. Your theology is not sound. Your doctrine is inaccurate, etc., etc., etc. You are Protestant, you are evangelical, you are charismatic, you are non-charismatic, you are independent, you are this, that, or something else. Therefore, you're out and we're in. That's the mentality. You get excluded, we're on the inside, you get to stay out there. <laughs> the joke, for, uh, I had some friends in <clears throat> Church of Christ, and the joke, and it, but this could be true for just about any group that has the mentality, they get, the, they get this sort of Superiority complex. We're talking about inferior, superior. That we're the only ones who have it right, Peggy. We got all the answers and the rest of you people are just guessing. And frankly, I'm kind of familiar with that mentality because I grew up in a non-denominational denominational, denomination. You tracking? Because, listen, it operates. All you have to do is just do something different, Dad. Just do something different. And you figure out very quick that there's a, there are a set of guidelines and rules that if you don't abide by them, and or you move in a different direction, you get excluded pretty fast. It's no different than any other denomination. We can talk about independence or freedom or, you know, non-denominational. We're not, we're, not, we're not caught up in that whole thing or whatever it is, but just do something different and see what happens, right? Dye your wool a different color and see what the other sheep do. See what the other sheep will do. See how the claws, she didn't know sheep had claws and teeth till you, till you dye your wool a different color. And then they come out. It's not a matter of reality. Oftentimes, it's only a matter of vocabulary. These cultures demand conformity. Lock in step with us or else. And not a single one of these distinctions exist in the bride of Jesus, the body into which we were baptized. Now, I think Jesus is literally talking about baptism in that passage as an outward sign of allegiance to him. But we know that Paul often talks about baptism, and he's talking about what happens when the Holy Spirit plunges us into Christ the moment that we believe in him. He's talking about it from a spiritual and eternal perspective. You are all sons of God. Listen to that. I think all is one of those inclusive phrases, Kevin. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That means you. That means me. The lady's are like, well, I don't want to be a son. Can I be a daughter? Yes. You're daughter of the Most High God. How about that? Daughter of the King. Every, every boy wants to know that he is a beloved son. Every girl wants to know that she is uh, the apple of her daddy's eye. Am I wrong? You are the beautiful daughters of the king. And gentlemen, you are beloved sons. Every one of you. Through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with him. There is neither Jew nor Greek, racial distinctions, slave nor free, social distinctions. And in Colossians 3.11, the apostle adds circumcised, which is a reference to Jew, or uncircumcised, a reference to Gentile. So listen, religious distinctions, because that's what he's talking about. When you're talking about whether somebody is circumcised or uncircumcised in the ancient world, Jew or Gentile, you're talking about their religious distinction. Barbarian, Scythian. Scythian was considered the most barbarous of barbarians, so cultural distinctions for it. Slave or free, that's the second time that Paul has used this. And here's, 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 what, uh, here's how we're going to use it the second time. Economic distinctions. Economic distinctions. None of those things exist in Christ. But Messiah is all and is in all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, and you do, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs of eternal life and the kingdom to come according to the promise. That's Galatians 3, 26 through 29. You getting the picture here? The ground is unbelievably level at the foot of the cross. Your primary identification is not of race or class or sex or religion. It's not how much money you make or don't make. And how big of a deal is that in our society? That is the issue that everybody wants to talk about. When someone talks about their business or what do you do for a living, and it becomes a matter of how much you make or don't make or want to make or are trying to make or would like to steal or whatever, right? Listen, when pastors fly all around the country to go to different, to different seminars on uh, whatever the latest wave is, whatever the latest fad is, whatever the latest book is, whatever the latest thing, and this is guaranteed to grow your church by 31% in 42 days or, you know, three easy steps, nine simple solutions to people slipping out the back, Jack, while your eyes are closed or w whatever. You know, there's always some new thing like that. Listen, how many of you have been, how many of you have been, believers for more than 30 years 40 most of most of the group 
that raised their hand for 30 can also raise their hand for 40. In four decades, how many different, how many different evangelical superstars have you seen come and go? Can you count the number? Think of all the different pastors that you've watched on TV, all the different sermons you've heard, all the different books you've read, all the different things that come and go. There's only one thing that never changes, and it's the Son of God. The Word of God doesn't change. The Spirit of God doesn't change. All this stuff, all this new stuff that's supposed to bring us flash and pop and, uh, and hordes of people and all the rest of that stuff, is, listen, every, it changes every quarter. There's something new just about every quarter of every year, at least sometime in the, in, in six month, from six months to six months to six months, some, at least twice a year there's some major fad of some kind. Usually it's quicker than that. If they all worked, why would we have 5,000 of them come and go in the last 40 years? There's probably 10 times that, honestly. It's probably been 50,000. If, if they all worked, why aren't, why aren't church in the United States full? Why aren't they full of people who worship God passionately and love each other deeply and give generously? And the resources, we have more churches on more corners and more buildings and more property and more people and more resources in the United States. And 95% of all the money that is taken into church in the United States gets spent in this country, on this continent. The need, for the most part, is way out there. Now, there was need in our society, in our county here because in some others because we had a, a devastating tornado but the need for the most part for missions and making disciples and is in a lot of other places why aren't we addressing needs that we talked about human trafficking right sexual slavery all this other stuff the church could unify its voice as one and speak to these things not social action for social action's sake but in the name and authority of the son of god stand and make its presence felt in the world and what we're doing we're marshalling the troops on sunday morning that's what, we do. That's what we're good at in America. I, I want you here. I want to worship with you. And I want to teach you whatever I can. Lead you wherever I can. But that's what we're good at in the United States. Warehousing the troops on Sunday morning. Not much good at a whole lot else. That's on us. There's no failures to point in any other direction. But back at ourselves. The least important thing about you, relationally, is how much money you make or don't make. There's no bearing on your identity before God and your value as a human being. It, this is an important message for people who actually have made a lot of money and or are making a lot of money now. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with succeeding financially. But if you think that makes you a better person than other people around you, you've got some serious uh, reconsidering to do, my friend. Male or female, either one. That's ego. The primary identification is not how much money you make or don't make or who you think you are because the world applauds you or the world despises you. Your primary color as a child of God is neither black nor white nor yellow nor brown. Your only identifying color now is red, blood red. That's our identifying color. Because you have been immersed in the blood of the crucified king, cleansed of all your sin, even sin to come in the future, and purified by his presence within you. There are no racial, cultural, or socioeconomic identifiers any longer. You are eternally identified with the king and his commission. Jesus is your identity. I think baptism is a critical component of discipleship. It's my personal and professional opinion because it publicly, publicly unites. The Holy Spirit unites us with Christ. And we trust him as our savior and our sovereign. But this is a public way, a, I always call it a public declaration of allegiance, if you will. Unites in a public way the newborn child of God with the virgin-born son of God. It's an, it's an intrinsic identification with Jesus Christ in his death to the sin within, the sin that we have, his death to the sin nature, Romans chapter 6, and his resurrection to new life. To be identified publicly symbolizes our submission to Jesus' authority. I have a king, I have a commander, and his kingdom is not of this world. My allegiance is not to the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Green Party, the whatever, 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 whatever party. My allegiance is to the Son of God and to his kingdom. Above all else, his will, his will be done. How about that? His kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. Symbolizes our surrender to his will and our willingness to live what we'll call Abba's way of love. Our absorption into the covenant of grace as, people, as part of the people of grace. Teaching them to obey. Final command there. Notice he says, not write down or record, not listen to and forget, not memorize and then let languish in the dark rooms of the mind, but obey. To walk in, to live from everything I have commanded you. In other words, you, this is not a pastor's job. This is what all disciples do. All followers of Jesus do. All apprentices of the master do. They go forth and replicate others. They train others. They teach others to do the same. 
teaching them to walk in the master's way, to follow in his footsteps, to listen for the shepherd's voice and trust his counsel above every other, no matter what the circumstance may be. You are trusting Jesus' counsel above all others, regardless of the circumstance. Teach them how to live in the truths that Jesus passed on to his followers in the Gospels. Everything which is necessary for life to the full. Listen, Shauna, until we put it into practice, we're believers, not followers. Until we take it out of the dusty archives of the soul and live it in the nasty here and now, we're believers, not followers. Until we start saying what we mean and doing what we say, we're believers, not followers. Don't tell people you're going to do something if you know you're not going to do it. Period. Keep your mouth shut. It's just that simple. Just learn to shut up. If you commit to something and something arises and there's a freak accident and both your legs are broken, you have an excuse. If there, and it's some, I mean, there's, there are things that are beyond our control sometimes. You may, there may be a wreck on a freeway somewhere and you're stranded for 30 minutes and you can't get wherever you need to be at that time. You say, listen, I'll be there as soon as I can. There are circumstances like that. If you know for a fact that you're just talking smack and you're not going to do this, keep your mouth shut. Don't commit to it in the church. Don't commit to it in a marriage. Don't commit to it anywhere if you're not going to do it. Say what you mean and do what you say. I quoted a proverb the other day. Just, I was reading through Proverbs, and I thought, huh, it has nothing to do with marriage. But I said, here's a little something for the ladies, and it says something about, I don't remember the first part, but the last part is a faithful man who can find. I was like, oh, ladies, what do you think about that? And they were like, amen. You know, and it, was, it really was kind of a joke because it's not about marriage, but it fits. It fits relationships in this day and age, a faithful man who can find. And I said, listen, gentlemen, it's a simple thing. Say what you mean and do what you say, period. Over and out. This is not hard. This is not hard. This character deficiency, this is, I mean, just say what you mean and do what you say. If you're not, I mean, bless, uh, bless the, the hearts of the people who have tried to organize calendars for people uh, helping in the back with the kids over the years over the past 10 years. God bless them all, man, because you talk about a mind-numbing, skull-crushing, uh, heart-wrenching exercise in futility. People, oh, sure, yeah, you know, I'm going to help. I'll do whatever. And then never show, call at the last minute, do all the rest of this kind of stuff. Just say what you mean and do what you say. If you can't be there, that's fine. Switch out with somebody else and handle your responsibility the next month or the next week or the whenever it is. Crazy, crazy stuff. When we, when we are operating that way, we're not followers. We're just believers. We're dilettantes playing a game of checkers on the chessboard of the word. So Jesus closes with these words, and this is it. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I mean, that's a comforting thought, isn't it? Oh, Jesus is with me. Oh, Jamie, he's with me. He's with me always when I'm, when I'm lonely, when I'm sick, when I am disheartened or in despair. Well, yeah, he is. Technically, that's true. He indwells us through his Holy Spirit, so yeah, Peggy, technically that's true. But that's not the point of this passage. I'm with you always. When you're just, oh, I just, I love that. And there's, that's good, but that's not the point of this passage. The point has to do with apprenticeship and apprentice making, David. That's the point of the passage. The king's commission is primary, secondary, and tertiary. Everything else is a second-rate substitute. It's a distraction from his commission, a deception of what he commanded, or something that's designed to destroy our desire to obey it. Jesus is with us through his spirit who indwells us, just as he promised in John 14, 26, and Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Everyone, everyone who believes in him as their savior and sovereign receives the precious gift of his life and righteousness in eternity, but only those who become followers experience and exercise his authority in time. Only those who become followers exercise his authority in time. Were there not varying circles of communion with Christ Jesus? intimacy with the Messiah during his days on earth. There were at least 500 believers, because Paul mentions their number in 1 Corinthians 15. There are 120 praying and prepared to receive the Spirit in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapters 1 and 2. There were 70 ranger buddies whom Jesus sent out to the lost sheep of Israel in Luke chapter 10. There were the 12 handpicked by the Master to be with him as integral to his mission. Then there were the three, Peter, James, and John. You following that? You notice how many times they go off with him alone from the rest of the disciples and like the transfiguration and they witness his glory shining through his body, his glory as God. They saw things, heard things, and experienced things which none of the other 12 had even imagined. You telling me they weren't closer in companionship to the king? 
Listen, and that's the point right there. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is with us to the extent that we are with him. Jesus is with us to the extent that we are with him. He's promised us the assurance of his authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I'm sending you out in my authority. All authority has been given to me. He's promised us the assurance of his authority and the presence of his power. I will be with you always as we fulfill his commission. Make disciples. And there it is. He's given us the assurance of his authority as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the presence, uh, the promise of his presence, I will be with you always as we fulfill his commission. So the question is, are we going to fulfill his commission? Are we fulfilling it now? Do we even have a desire to raise up others to follow him and become follower makers, disciple makers, apprentices of Jesus. If we don't, then maybe this promise is not for us. Just something to think about. I love you. And uh, I'm not trying to paint a picture of second-class Christians in any way, shape, or form because it, the intimacy that you have with the Son of God all depends on you. Nobody else is forcing you to the back of the bus or into another room or this or that or anything else. Draw near to God and he will what? Draw near to you. We just saw that in James not too long ago. This depends on simply on do we want to pursue God and are we willing to accept the work that he wants to accomplish in our lives? Do we want to become apprentices of the master and learn how to live from his kingdom and do we want to teach others to do the same? Because that's what this passage is about. Remember, it's the great commission, the king's commission, not the great suggestion, right? Okay, let's pray. Happy Mother's Day to you. Father, it's a blessing to be here and just to be a part of your plan and to be under the banner of your grace. And I pray now that uh, truth would ring loud and clear in our souls. You've given us enormous freedom to operate, to live, to love, to move, to breathe. You've given us in tremendous, tremendous freedom and latitude within our own personalities, and you've made us unique, every one of us, a unique creation. We're not all uh, created like flowers in a field where, I mean, every single aspect is the same. We are unique, each one. A beautiful multicolored rose in and of itself. We were designed to shine your glory, your power, your light, your love, and your life to a dark and dying world. May we embrace that light. May we simply open our arms and open our hearts and say, shine through me, Jesus, Son of God. Live through me, Jesus. Breathe through me, Holy Spirit, and speak into the hearts of the world. Start with our family. Start with our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents. Just give us the courage, the tact, the respect to say, I love you. I respect you. Maybe we need to say, I forgive you. Maybe we need to say, please forgive me. Whatever it takes to bridge that gap, let this be a day of healing and restoration, a day when our hearts are turned to the King's commission and where we're encouraged to know that we have the power and the authority to execute it. This is not about anything we can manufacture or maneuver You've given us all we need, and we praise you, and we honor you, and we bless you, Jesus. I would ask now, that as these people go forth, your love would resound in their hearts. They would be lifted uh, and not discouraged by what they've heard here today. We honor you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In your holy and powerful name, amen.